Mr. Chair, you do have a quorum. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm calling to order the May 2022 meeting of the IHCBA Board of Directors. Our meeting pursuant to this board's policy for participation by members of the IHCBA Board of Directors and board meetings by, simultane by simultaneous electronic presentation. This means that only three members must be physically present at the site of the meeting and the remaining members may call in. We're meeting only a fee for the general public so that members of the public can listen to me and there will be a link to a video recording posted on IHCBA's website next month. At the time the motions are being made, each board member that takes the motion must state his or her name and last name for the record. Those will be then be tallied by roll call. I will now take roll call of the board members to confirm members who are present and their invitation. My name is Ryan Clem, uh, I'm a designee for Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch uh, in person. Mark Pastrella, designee for the Public Finance Director for the State of Indiana. Here. Elemental State Treasurer here. Judith Medicine. You can ask. We have those. Oh, okay. We have uh, any place remote? Uh, Mike, any Schaubier. Place here. Mike Schaubier present. For sure. All right. And Tom McGowan? No. Okay. All right, well then we will move to the first item of the agenda. First item is the approval of the minutes from the April 28th, 2022 board meeting. Uh, board, any questions on those minutes? Mike Schaubier, move for approval. Thank you, Mike, do we have a second? Mark Pascal, second. All right, great. Uh, then so we'll do by roll call, uh, Brian Clem, uh, with the LG's office, votes aye. Mark Pascal, aye. Kelly Mitchell, aye. Jude Mitchell, aye. Andy Place, aye. Mike Schottmeyer, aye. All right, thank you. Uh, hearing no opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Mr. Chair, uh, just so there's no confusion, I think that the first item that was on there for uh, greens has been removed, but I think it's still on some of the items. Okay. The actual first item. Uh, okay. Okay. Apologize for that. Yeah. No, thank you. Okay. All right. So uh, we'll next welcome uh, Presenter Alan Murkowski to provide a monthly update regarding the tax credit assistance program policy and delegate, delegated authority. Yes, good morning. Uh, Alan Rakowski, Director of Real Estate Allocation, here today for the monthly TCAP update. So this is the uh, monthly IHCDA update on the Tax Credit Assistance Program, otherwise known as TCAP, uh, pursuant to the delegated authority granted to IHCDA's Deputy Executive Director and Chief Real Estate Development Officer on September 23rd and extended on March 24th. The following two awards are made after the last board meeting to tax credit deals that were negatively impacted by cost increases. Those two developments are Madison Loss in Fort Bill, uh, developed by MBAH Developments. It's new construction and a $500,000 loan was made. And Historic Allison Square in Marion, uh, developed by McKinley Development LLC. Uh, they said re rehab developments, uh, $500,000 in TCAP uh, was awarded. And uh, this project was from 2020. This brings the total number of approvals to 16 since the policy was enacted, totaling $6.3 million in TCAP money. I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. All right, any questions for Alan? All right, since this is an update, the vote is not required, so thank you, Alan. All right, thank you. Next, welcome uh, Peter Nelson, who will present the monthly update regarding the Housing Trust Fund and Development Fund Policies and Delegated. Thank you. Good morning, board. Uh, I am Peter Nelson. I'm the Home and Public Trust Fund Manager. Um, I am here today and very excited to provide the first update um, for our Housing Trust Fund and Development Fund Policies and Delegated Authority. So just I'll do a little more background just since this is the first update. But um, if the board may recall in November of last year, um, the board approved awarding or allowing our Deputy Executive Director and Chief Real Estate Development Officer to take actions necessary 
restored home and housing trust fund projects that have been negatively impacted by cost increases uh, to seek out development fund and housing trust fund respectively of what I just mentioned. Um, so provided that we offer these monthly updates. So I am very excited to announce these first awards that we've made. So for the housing trust fund, um, we have approved one project since our last board meeting. Um, it, it is to Hannah Commons, a permanent supportive housing project in Indianapolis. They received an award of $500,000 in housing trust fund. For the development fund policies, two home awards were awarded some additional funding of development fund. They were awarded $500,000 to the Community Action Program of Evansville, also known as CAPE, for the flats of Oakland City in Oakland City, Indiana, and $379,687 to Whitley Crossings Neighborhood Corporation for the Cluxton Apartments Rehab in, Cluxton, or in Columbia City. So, um, totaling those two projects, you know, the $879,687 total in development fund awarding for that. So, happy to take any questions on either of these policies or the, the projects that, that were awarded uh, in the past month. Thank you. Any questions for Peter? All right, since this is an update, a vote is not required. So, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, we're going to welcome our next presenter, uh, Greg Glassley, to present a recommendation regarding the Department of Energy Weatherization Readiness Funds. Good morning, board. I'm Greg Glassley, the Director of Energy and Utility Programs. Uh, for each year, the Department of Energy provides ICDA with funding for the Weatherization Assistance Program. Uh, which is allocated sub grantees according to a formula that has been approved by the board previously. This year, in addition to those funds, DOE provided a new segment of funding called Weatherization Readiness Funds in the sum of $411,078. These funds are designated to use in addressing structural and health and safety issues in homes that are currently in the queue to be weatherized, but at risk of deferral. So this funding is specifically targeted to reduce the frequency of deferred homes that require other services outside the scope of weatherization before the weatherization services can commence. Uh, to equitably distribute readiness funds to NDS 20 weatherization subgrantees, IPCDA staff recommends the use of a modified allocation table to decrease the dollar amount from base dollars to $10,000 per agency to account for the lower dollar amount that will be distributed through this portion of the award. The remaining allocation amount $211,078 will be distributed to agencies utilizing the previously approved weatherization allocation table. Using the modified allocation table, each of the current weatherization subgrantees will receive the amount of readiness funds as indicated in table A. Happy to take any questions. Have board any questions for Greg? Seeing none, uh, Greg, we're ready for your resolution. The staff respectfully requests the board pass the following resolution. Resolved that the board approve the allocation of $411,078 in weatherization readiness funds to Indiana's existing weatherization subgrantees using the modified allocation table in the DOT amounts indicated in table A as recommended by staff. All right, board, uh, we have a resolution before us and we'll entertain a motion. Great. Um, do we have a second? Great. Uh, they will roll vote. Uh, chair votes aye. Mark Pascal, aye. Kelly Mitchell, aye. Jim Nithias, aye. Andy Place, aye. Mike Schottmeyer. Mike Schottmeyer, aye. Thank you. All right. If you're in the one uh, opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, Greg will also present a recommendation regarding the Duke Energy Weatherization Supplemental Health and Safety Funds. Sure. So this year, Duke Energy is providing $200,000 in Supplemental Health and Safety Funds to IACDA and its subgrantees to be expended in the 2022 calendar year. Supplemental Health and Safety Funds are intended to mitigate the cost of repairs and maintenance that are required prior to a home being able to be weatherized. These funds must be used on homes served by Duke Energy, and each one. Each home must be weatherized once the program, once required repairs have been completed. Additionally, as IHCDA begins this new program, Duke Energy has requested that IHCDA 
utilize a portion of this funding to upgrade the IWOP data system to track program outcomes, and it's also asked IPCA to hold back 25% of the funding to be made available for high-performing agencies midway through the year. In accordance with Duke Energy's request described above, IPCA plans to allocate the following. IPCDA administrative cost of $8,095, technology updates up to $30,000, funding to subgrantees $121,429, and funding to high-performing subgrantees midway through the year $40,476. Since this is currently a one-year investment from Duke Energy, IHCDA proposes to use a pilot program model. IHCDA has identified five subgrantee agencies, shown in the table below, to partner with IHCDA in this pilot program. These five agencies were chosen because each has a significant Duke Energy presence in their territory, and each were not on a weatherization quality improvement plan for the 2021 program. Each pilot agency will receive funding to address the following health and safety concerns. Mold remediation, brick repairs and replacements, plumbing repairs, electrical repairs, asbestos remediation, structural repairs, and other, other safety measures, including accessibility changes to the home for that entry. Throughout the 2022 calendar year, testing this pilot five agencies will allow ICEA to determine how to better implement the reporting requirements, Understand the successes and challenges and identify what improvements and modifications could be made if Duke chooses to continue to fund this effort. Even though many weatherization agencies will not have access to Duke Health and Safety funds through this pilot program, all agencies will have access to funds that can be used to bring homes out of deferral to the Department of Energy's readiness funds that we discussed. Happy to take any questions. Board, any questions for Bray? Yeah. When does the program begin? The program was so it started. The discussions began beginning this year. So we worked on a statement of work contract with Duke to make sure that uh, the exact measures were were approved upon, and then we worked a little bit with making sure our reporting system uh, can handle it. So it's already begun. We've had several discussions with the, the five pilot agencies we targeted, um, and they're they're ready to go. They're excited for. There are some funds that aren't as restricted as as usual, so we have we're we're ready to go when you know, it's approved. Okay, thank you. And similar program than the one we just did, right? It is similar. So concept in concept. In concept, yeah. This is a little bit more restricted in the sense that it's Duke because of Duke money. It's has its own Duke funds, whereas the readiness funds are you know, we're allocating that to all twenty subgrantees just to help with all homes. Size of OPA and that compensation make sure the Duke Energy people get the Duke money so we can maximize. Correct. And that's part of the you know reporting that we're working on is making sure we're tracking the funds correctly. Any further questions for Brian? Right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, great. Uh, we're ready for your resolutions. Uh, you had two resolutions, correct? Two resolutions, mm -hmm. yeah. Correct. We did one at a time or both at the same time? If, unless the board rejects, we can. Both at the same time. Okay. So, staff respectfully request the board pass the following resolutions. Resolve that the board approve allocation of $121,429 of Duke supplemental health and safety funds evenly to five pilot agencies described in Table A as recommended by staff. Resolve that the board approve allocation of $40,476 of Duke supplemental health and safety funds evenly to any of the five pilot agencies that have spent. At least half of their initial lot allocation by September 1st, 2022, and have expressed and shown the interest and ability to expend additional Duke supplemental health and safety funds to be approved by the executive director by NCDA prior to allocation as recommended by staff. Mike Schottmeyer moves for approval. All right, thank you. Do you make a second? All right, and we'll take a roll call on both resolutions. Uh, Chair Bill said I. Mark Pascal, aye. Kelly Mitchell, aye. Jim Hitchcock, aye. Andy Place, aye. Mike Schottmeyer, aye. All right, hearing no one opposed, motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. Okay, our next presenter will be Ms. Rita Island, present a recommendation regarding the Individual Development Account Program Administration Administrator approval. Good morning. Thank you for having me today. My name is Desiree Island. I am here to request the approval for the next round of awards of individual development accounts. 
These accounts provide a match savings opportunity for low income individuals to set goals, save, purchase eligible assets, and attain greater self sufficiency. The match funds are provided to participants at a rate of three to one so that participants save up to $1,500 to receive the $4,500 in match. The combined $6,000 savings and match can be used for the purchase of a home, a vehicle, or to cover costs related to education, small business, or home repairs. IDB administrators work with participants through the savings and purchase process, as well as through the required financial education that all participants must complete. This year, ICDA received $597,746 as state appropriation. $52,000 $246 will be used for ICBA administrative expenses and a recommended allocation of $535,500 to IDA administrators for the program round. These funds will be available for agencies to use for four years, and the majority will be used as a match for participant savings, up to $4,500 per account. In addition, the match funds, in addition to match funds, IDA administrators will have access to $750 per account in administrative funds. We opened the application for 2022 IDA administrators in March for three weeks. All applications were reviewed based on previous experience with the IDA program or similar programs. The number of counties served, plans for recruiting participants, plans for fulfilling the educational requirement, and how IDA fits with an organization's mission. Applications had to score 65 out of the 100, out of 100 points to pass threshold and to be qualified to administer in individual development accounts. ITDA received 24 oh. applications. Of those 24, six applications failed to meet the threshold and so were disqualified from receiving accounts this year. There was a total request of 174 accounts and of those, 146 were from agencies who met threshold. However, the total ICDA budget can only accommodate 102 awards. We base the recommended number of accounts per agency on the following criteria. New agencies or agencies that received accounts last year that did not open any accounts last year have their request automatically set to three. Remaining agencies receive 50% of their account requests or five accounts, whichever is highest. Over the next four years, the key performance indicators that people track include the number of accounts that are open, and of those, how many accounts are ultimately used for asset purchases, as well as the types of purchases made. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Board members, any questions for Desiree? I have a question. Sure. Can you remind me how it works? Um, like how does the money actually get dispersed? Is it every year or is it at the end of the three years or at the end of the time they say 1500 or? I'm sure. Um, so the participants can save up to 1500 and when they are ready to make their asset purchase at any time, um, that is when those funds become available to them. Okay. And if they, so in one year, if they save 500, they don't automatically get that 1500. If they, I, I'm saying if they have an asset they want to purchase that's less than, say it's 2000. And they don't need to save 1500. How yes. does that work? Um, yes, so they can make purchases um, as, as they say, so they okay. can make more than one purchase if that is within their plan. Oh, thank you. Yes. Has the program been growing? Um, it really has been uh, similar to last year. So last year we actually requested um, 103 slots, this year we are requesting 102. And it's spending all the money then that the appropriations. Yes, we are still working to, to get that expended, um, but agencies are working to get that money spent. I'm just curious to see if the program has been doing what its original goal was and increasing. Yes. So, which is great. I mean, that's obviously the goal. Great. Any other questions for Desiree? If not, uh, Desiree, you ready for your resolution? Staff respectfully request the board to approve the following resolution. Resolved that the board approves awarding IDA funding in an aggregate amount not to exceed $535,500 to the applicants as set forth in Table A to administer the IDA program for the program term beginning July 1st, 2022 and ending 
June 30th, 2026, as recommended by staff. All right, we have a resolution before us and I'll uh, make a motion. All right, we have a first, we have a second. Kelly Mitchell, second. All right, next we will, uh, if I roll call, the chair votes aye. Mark Pascal, aye. Kelly Mitchell, aye. June Mitchell, aye. Andy Place, aye. Mike Schottmeyer, aye. And do we have Tom McGowan join us? Or we're working on that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So here you go. Uh, opposed. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, Desiree, uh, welcome back. <laughs> also present a recommendation regarding the 2022-2023 individual developmental development account tax credit allocation approval. Um, so my second presentation is to request approval for the next round of awards of individual development account tax credits. These tax credits should help IDA administrators to raise private funds for their IDA program, specifically to increase the amount of accounts they manage. The way the funds work is that the administrators distribute tax credits to donors in exchange for a financial contribution. The tax credits are worth 50% of the contribution and can be used on the donor's state tax liability. If the donor contributes $200 to the IDA program, they are eligible for a $100 state tax credit. Each year, $200,000 total in tax credits are available for distribution by IHCDA to IDA administrators. Interested administrators identify their request for tax credits in the regular IDA program application form. The application, the applicants must also meet threshold for programmatic questions in the application to be considered for tax credit. This year, ICDA received two requests for the IDA tax credits totaling $61,875. Both agencies met threshold. Therefore, we recommend both agencies receive the tax credits requested as listed in Table A in your board packet. These tax credits will provide funding for 22 additional IDA accounts. As for key performance indicators, we will track the dollar amount of credits the administrator successfully distribute and share donor information with DOR to facilitate the tax credit. Are there any questions? All right, board, any uh, questions for Desiree? If not, uh, Desiree will break the resolution. Staff respectfully request the board to approve the following resolution. Resolved that the board approve allocating IDA tax credits in an aggregate amount not to exceed $61,875 to the applicant as set forth in Table A as recommended by staff. All right, well, we have a resolution before us. I'll entertain a motion. Chairman, you move to approve. And we have a motion. We have a second. Mark Costco. Any place second. All right, second. All right, we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, and the chair votes aye. Mark Costco, aye. Kelly Mitchell, aye. June Mitchell, aye. Andy Place, aye. Mike Schottmeyer, aye. Yeah, oh, we're oh. still in, sorry. And uh, Tom McGowan, do we have you on the line? Oh, yeah. No, I think I'm sorry. All right. Um, hearing no one opposed, the motion passes unanimously, so thank you. That's great. Thank you. Brian, this was done by him. Next, uh, our vice chairman will welcome uh, Richard Harcourt, who will present a recommendation regarding the Rear Affordable Assisted Living Project for financing bond recommendation. Morning, board. The purpose of this memo and attached resolution is to request the approval of the issuance of a multifamily housing revenue bond not to exceed $15,415,000 and the loan <coughs> of proceeds that are up to the borrower at River AAL Senior LP to redeem previously issued bonds and refinance the multifamily housing project described in the resolution. Uh, so this is a uh, assisted living facility of 124 units on the east side of town in operations in 2015. This is a little different from what we typically ask. This is uh, this is a project that uh, is already up and running and it's financing this through uh, the city of Indianapolis. It's, it's tax exempt financing. 
the borrower or the developer has approached IHCDA and asked that we uh, reissue those bonds under our name uh, to help them get to market quicker. They're refinancing at a, uh, a lower interest rate uh, and speed to market is, is imperative here. Rates are rising. The city of Indianapolis has, I think, a three public meeting process to go through it. So this allows them to access the, the market a little bit quicker uh, if we issue. The good news is uh, the tax uh, uh, the tax exempt volume is out there, so there's no new tax exempt volume being used by us to use the existing volume uh, uh, to refinance it. Uh, this is a current client of ours. We already have a, a development with them that performs well, and we would anticipate doing additional developments with them. So. Uh, you know, I think the keys to this are it's non-recourse conduit financing, uh, where we will be the issuer, but not using not using volume cash. So let's stop there and take questions. I think any questions from the board? Hearing none, uh, let's go right to your resolution. Thank you. Staff respectfully requests the board approve the following resolution. Resolved. That the board approved the series 2022 multifamily housing revenue bonds for the loan of the proceeds thereof to Ritter AAL Senior LP pursuant to the attached resolution. Move by staff. All right, well, we have a resolution before us. So I'll entertain a motion. Andy, no, place no, motion for approval. I will right. second Andy's. All right, second. We have a first and a second. Uh, we will do a roll call. Uh, chair votes aye. Mark Pascal aye. Kelly Mitchell aye. Jim Mitchell aye. Andy Place aye. Mike Schottmeyer aye. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, hearing no one opposed, motion passes unanimously. So thank you. Uh, Richard will also uh, present a recommendation regarding the Clarity and Collins Preservation Project bond. The purpose of this memo and attached resolution is to request the approval of the issuance of the series 2022 multifamily housing revenue bonds, uh, parentheses, F and C preservation project, close parentheses, not to exceed 30 million 200,000 for no less bonds. Uh, so this is a little bit more traditional than what we've done in the past. If you as a board approve these three projects uh, in June of 2021, and this is a request for uh, IETDA to be the issuer of the non recourse tax exempt financings, but instead of bundling it into three different projects, it's being bundled into one financing. So, this is uh, represents Douglas Point up in uh, Hammond for 64 units, Emerald Point in South Bend for 168 units, and Mystic Glen um, in Hebron, Indiana for 80 units. A total of 312 units. Uh, this is uh, a family living. Uh, and again, uh, you all have uh, approved this in June of 2021. We're just asking the commission to be sure. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, board, any questions for Richard? Hearing none, uh, Richard, we're ready for your resolution. Thank you. Staff respectfully request the board approve the following resolution. Resolved that the board approve the series 2022 multifamily housing revenue bonds, parentheses, F and C preservation project, close parentheses. Pursuant to the resolution attached here to as exhibit A as recommended by staff. All right, the resolution. Uh, Andy, have a motion. So moved, Mark Pascal. Second, Andy, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we'll go uh, Kelly Gold to vote the uh, chair for the time. Mark Pascal, aye. Kelly Mitchell, aye. June Mitchell, aye. Andy, please, aye. Mark Schottmeyer, aye. All right. Uh, and he passed unanimously. Uh, the motion passed unanimously. So. Yeah, I don't know. Thank you, board. He said he said it too. And that's just welcome, touching. Uh, Michael McQuillan sent a summary of IHC funding programs for 2021. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and board members. My name is Michael McQuillan, and I serve as the Director of Industry and Governmental Affairs for IHCDA. Uh, recently, our staff worked together to put together a summary of all the funding programs affecting the authority. I'd like to thank our legislative liaison, Bon Sweet, for her efforts on this project, as well as Dave Stewart, our general counsel, for compiling on this report. Attached to your board packet, you'll find an item by item listing of our programs. 
and you may have had the opportunity to look for that information to see if you have any questions. So I thought I would just briefly review a few of the programs as, as examples as to how to pull out the information that you might need. I'll start with IERA, or the Indiana Emergency Rental Assistance Program, since it has the largest attached dollar amounts, and it's also the program about which I received most questions from our state and federal legislators, as well as our other partners. So if you'll peek at page 39 of your packet, you'll see that it is, of course, a federally funded program with the Agency of Oversight being the U.S. Department of Treasury. And the 2021 appropriations were around $372 million for Part 1, and approximately $292 million for Part 2. Uh, then it follows with a brief program overview and a note that this is a special allocation which runs through 2025. Each of the other programs in this document follows the same format with differences noted. For example, a couple of pages later on page 40 is HTF, which is the National Housing Trust Fund. Uh, it's also federal, but in this case has HUD, or Department of Housing and Urban Development as the overseas agency. Again, the dollar amount of around uh, $10.5 million is listed, along with the narrative on its purpose, and the mention that this, pro uh, this program is ongoing. Uh, the last few pages of the document cover state-funded programs. On page 42, you will see HFP, or the Housing First Program, which is state-funded, with IHCPA providing oversight. Its 2021 appropriation was about $900,000, followed by its purpose, uh, which is stated as quickly and successfully providing permanent housing to those in need, as well as other supported services being noted. It concludes with the mention that this is an ongoing program, the annual allocation from the state of Indiana. So I want you to please feel free to review this document at your leisure. If you have any questions about any of the programs, just let me know and I'll track down the answer. Or if you have any questions now, uh, we're fortunate to have several of the directors and executives that oversee these programs here in the room, and I'm sure they would be happy to answer any of your questions. That, Mr. Chairman, back to you. All right, any questions? Uh, hearing none, so since it's an updated vote, will not, not be required. So thank you, Mr. Thank you. Uh, next up, Executive Director Jacob Sight, by the Executive Update. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman and uh, members of IDC Board of Directors. Um, for my weekly or for my monthly update, uh, I'll start with the uh, Homeowner Assistance Fund. These are dollars that we've received from the U.S. Department of Treasury. Uh, and uh, these go towards uh, foreclosure prevention for homeowners um, who have been impacted by the pandemic. Um, last week, uh, we released a dashboard that uh, shows uh, some data as it relates to uh, the program and is broken down by county. Uh, but just at a high level, um, that, that information and those data points are related to the number of applications we have received and their, where they are, their status, demographics, uh, the homeowners, and some of the assistance data as well. So as of uh, yesterday, we've received just over 3,400 applications and uh, we've distributed just a uh, around $2 million of a homeowner assistance fund to 327 households. Um, the Indiana Emergency Rental Assistance Program, um, our households that we've served is just around 25,000, and we have obligated or paid out just over $304 million. Um, we continue to post a weekly uh, ERA report on our website as well. It also breaks that information down by county. The energy assistance program, the um, application deadline was May 16th, so uh, that was the last day that uh, um, individual households could apply for energy assistance. Um, we have currently have uh, approved just over um, 105,000 households for energy assistance. Um, approximately 34,000 of those households have received crisis benefit. Um, and so the total amount that so far that we've obligated out is just over $111 million. Um, and over the next few weeks, um, we have around the, at the local level with our local service providers that are administering the EAP, EAP program. They're processing about 7,500 applications currently uh, to determine uh, qualifications and their benefits. So um, those are the ones that uh, we had received up until the May 16th deadline. So 
We also post a monthly report on EAP and also breaking it down by county on the website as well. Um, the other update I want to give is um, related to the qualified allocation plan and specifically the general set aside. Um, under the general set aside of the QAP, 10% uh, of the available credits, the competitive 9% credits, are set aside for developments that further IHCDA's mission and housing goals. Um, and it is done at the discretion uh, at IHCDA and, uh, and how we allocate those credits. Um, IHCDA, uh, as part of that process that we use to determine the uh, way in which we want to allocate those credits, we host and uh, uh, provide an opportunity uh, for the public to give us feedback on the purpose of the general set aside. Um, and uh, we really appreciate the feedback that we get from that. Um, and so we have that done in a public hearing and also we will accept uh, written comments. On May 16th, uh, we hosted a public hearing um, and invited um, the public in to provide us with feedback on how to best utilize the uh, general set aside, 9% credits. And the takeaway that we had from that public meeting and then also uh, some written comments that we received that there were three types of recommendations in terms of how we should utilize the general set aside for 2023. Um, the first one, recommendation was very specific and that was to have a tax credit round specific for recovery housing developments that provide supportive services for individuals in recovery from a substance use disorder so we had that was one the second recommendation that we had was to use the tax credit general set aside as an innovation round that would allow developers to submit proposals to identify a community challenge or an issue that would be incorporated into affordable housing, and that would also contribute to improving the community. Um, and some examples of that would include recovery housing, which would be one of those examples, uh, addressing food deserts, access to health care, improved educational outcomes, transportation solutions, uh, supporting small business entrepreneurship startups, housing cost containment strategies, anti-poverty solutions, or infrastructure improvements were some of the examples that um, we have been given um, as it relates to having an innovation round. Uh, we've had innovation rounds before in the past, um, and those are some of the things that the examples that we would, we would traditionally see as that. The third uh, uh, recommendation that we received was that uh, was to award the tax credits for the next highest scoring applications from the 2023 uh, tax credit round that would have not received credits based on their score. So there was that, that was the other, that was the third recommendation that we received. So all three of those um, were, uh, are, are, you know, make valid points in terms of how to best utilize the credits. Um, there are, um, there were also two other recommendations that we received outside of just how we prioritize the credits. And I wanna mention those because it is important and, and there were recommendations for IHCBA to improve. Uh, they, they, the, the public would like to see IHCDA improve in terms of how we communicate um, the general set aside and the purpose of the set aside. Uh, so we got feedback that sometimes it was a little bit vague or, or foggy in terms of what we were trying to accomplish with the, the general set aside. Um, and then um, the, the second recommendation that I think also was very valid was to require the developments, um, if we were to have an innovation round of some type, uh, track their key performance indicators after the development was placed in service to measure the community impact. So if we are going to um, challenge ourselves and have an innovation round, we need to make sure that we're measuring um, the anticipated outcomes of what the developments are trying to accomplish in, in terms of improving their community. So those were two of the uh, feedbacks that were received. Uh, as it relates to outside of how we prioritize the general set aside. Um, along with that, though, I do want to acknowledge and thank Prosperity Indiana and the Indiana Affordable Housing Council for providing us with feedback uh, as a membership organization to the general set aside. Um, that information they provided us was very helpful. Um, so the next step in where we are, where we're going, is uh, we're going to um, continue to um, look deeper into the three recommendations that were provided to us. 
um, and we will um, make a determination on what is the best route we want to go and utilize the general mm -hmm. status of for IHCBA in terms of it promoting our mission. And uh, so um, I hope that we can make an announcement within the next 30 or 60 days in terms of which direction we would like to, to go with the general status side. So and I'll make sure I update the board on, on that direction once we make that determination. So. The next item I want to mention is uh, on June 16th, the Indiana Permanent Support Housing Institute um, will have the uh, final presentations, kind of a graduation ceremony. Uh, this year we have eight teams from around the state uh, that will be presenting their permanent support housing development plans. Um, and they will be celebrating the completion of the institute. You know, the institute is about a four or five month process, and they uh, go through the uh, training about three days a week, I'm sorry, three days a month, um, and through a team. So it's not just uh, one person, it really is a team effort that goes through that. And our partnership with the Corporation for Supportive Housing to host that institute for those five or five months or so. Um, it is quite intensive um, commitment for the teams to go through it. Um, and so we will be celebrating the completion um, and uh, being a, having an opportunity to see the plans um, from the 80 teams on how they plan to develop permanent supportive housing uh, across our state. So the event will be virtual, and uh, if any board members uh, are interested in, in attending or if you'd like to just uh, to, uh, drop by virtually, uh, let me know and I'll make sure that you have an invite to uh, the webinar. So uh, the last item is uh, the June board meeting will be June 23rd. And that location will be here at IBCPA at 10 a.m. Eastern, and it will also have an opportunity to uh, have uh, virtual uh, as well attendance. So, with that, uh, uh, Chairman, I will turn it back over to you for any other questions. Thank you, Director uh, Sides. Any other questions for the Director? Is there any other business uh, for the Board today? I have two comments. Sure. Uh, there's going to be three documents going around for signature. Uh, two bond resolutions will go to every board member for their signature. And then the board minutes from last month, they just go to you, Mr. Chair, and Mr. Sykes. So right. expect those within the next hour after the board meeting. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other business? All right. Hearing no other business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. At Thank you. 1042 8.